Hello, my name is Cathy McLaughlin. I'm an art historian and lecturer working with Art Pursuits, Morley College and the Victoria and Albert Museum. I have a special interest in the workings of the 19th century art market, the world of exhibitions, dealers and collectors. I'm fascinated by the dynamic relationships between patrons and artists and the tensions that emerge as ambitions and expectations change over time. One fascinating case is the relationship between the painter Gustave Courbet and his patron Alfred Buyas. Their short-lived collaboration between 1853 and 1855 began in a spirit of friendship and shared ideals, but would end in a collision between opposing views of art and patronage. Today I want to trace the various stages in this story. It starts in the 1840s with a young man's dreams for a small art collection in the provincial town of Montpellier, and it concludes in Paris in 1855 with a huge international exhibition and one painter's ambition to be France's leading modern master. We'll see just how much the painter, Courbet, owed to his patron Brias, and we'll also examine the issues that divided them. Though brief in time, their encounter provides remarkable insights into the changing world of 19th century art. In the second part of this talk, I'll be looking at Courbet and his work during the 1850s. But I want to start with our collector, Alfred Buyas, and the development of his interests in art. He was born and grew up in Montpellier, the son of a wealthy banker, Jacques Buyas. Jacques hoped that in course of time, his son Alfred would join him in the family business and become a respectable pillar of the local community. However, things didn't go to plan. Young Alfred grew up to be the kind of son every respectable 19th century businessman dreaded. Frail and often ill with tuberculosis and rheumatism, sensitive, vain, refined, dreamy, melancholic, idealistic, and worst of all, he was passionate about art. As a young man, Alfred dreamt of becoming a painter, and around 1840, he trained for a short time in the studio of a modern artist in Montpellier. He soon realised the limits of his own abilities and decided that his true vocation was to be a collector. But his time as an art student proved to be formative, first in connecting him with other young painters and sculptors, some of whom became his lifelong friends, and second, more importantly, in shaping his ambitions as an art patron. For Brias, collecting was about much more than the acquisition of beautiful, expensive objects. It was a creative process involving active collaboration between patron and artists. He also felt that patronage had a social purpose. Brias was an idealist. He fervently believed in art's potential to enlighten people and their leaders, and ultimately to improve the lot of humanity. As a collector, he imagined himself opening a window onto a better future. Despite objections from his father, Brias affirmed his new vocation with a trip to Italy in the summer of 1846. The immediate goal was to complete his artistic education by visiting the great collections of Naples, Perugia, Florence, Venice and Rome. He was and he w as he would have been well aware, following the course that had been followed by generations of artists and collectors before him. In Rome, Buyas met up with old friends from his time as a student in Montpellier. These included the painter Alexandre Cabanel, who had recently won a scholarship to the French Academy and thereby become part of an elite group of young French artists living and studying in one of Rome's most beautiful buildings, the Villa Medici. Cabanel made Buyas welcome and also introduced him to his friends at the villa. For Buyas, the experience must have recalled memories of his time as an art student in Montpellier and may also have aroused dreams of once again becoming part of an artistic community. The painting here, made as a souvenir of Buyas's time in Rome, 
presents all the characteristics that made him such an instantly recognisable figure. The refined, elegant pose, stylish dress, and above all, the brilliant red hair and beard. It also suggests his rather conservative tastes. Cabanel has set him against the backdrop of the Borghese Gardens and the hills outside Rome, a setting that carries associations with the classical and Renaissance past. And in its technique also, the work bears all the hallmarks of the academic style, which Cabanel practised throughout his career and which Brias appreciated at this early stage in his collecting. With the polished finish, meticulous draftsmanship, precise modelling and balanced composition, we're seeing exactly what Brias liked. In addition to making contact with artists, Brias's time in Italy shaped his wider ambitions as a collector. His imagination was fired above all by the achievements of the Medici. The Villa Medici in Rome was itself a part of their legacy, and in Florence Brias experienced the results of their art patronage. Medici support for the likes of Botticelli, Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci had helped to make Florence the epicentre of the Italian Renaissance. Brias would no doubt have seen Ottavio Vanini's fresco of the Palazzo Pitti, celebrating Lorenzo de Medici's role as a patron of the arts during the 15th century. Enthroned in the midst of a group of young artists, he appears to direct their efforts and gestures towards the work of the young Michelangelo. We see the sculptor bowing as if in submission to Lorenzo's advice. The Medici, of course, were bankers, and as the son of a banker himself, Brias began to imagine himself as a kind of latter-day Medici, using his wealth, as they had done, to support contemporary art. Perhaps he dreamt of achieving in Montpellier something equivalent to Florence's Renaissance. What we do know is that in letters he began to use the phrase new Medici after his signature. Back in Montpellier, Brias began looking for painters who might help him to realise his ambitions. He turned, first of all, to a young artist called Auguste Glaze, another native of Montpellier and, like Cabanel, rather conservative in style. He had recently won success at the Paris Salon of 1846 with a work called The Blood of Venus, Typical of the type of classicising nude so popular during this period, the painting had been purchased by the French state for the local museum in Montpellier, where it immediately caught the young collector's eye. Brias marked each of his new collaborations with the commissioning of a portrait. He was obsessed with his own appearance, and he also wanted to build up through these portraits a sort of painted history of his development as a collector. In the portrait by Glaze, Bouillas appears as a kind of prince of the arts. He is draped in a type of shawl known as a bernus, a gift from another of his artist friends, Jules Laurent, who had just returned from a trip to the Middle East. But the setting, with its mountains and ancient ruins, refers us to the Italian beginnings of Bouillas the collector, the young woman by his side, crowned with a laurel wreath, may be understood as an embodiment of that country, or perhaps as Brias's muse. The dedication inscribed on the base of the column reads, to Signor A. Brias, friend and instigator of the arts, from your affectionate painter. Glaze also produced a fascinating record of the collection at an early point in its development, the interior of Brias's study. Commissioned after Brias's second trip to Italy of 1848, the work gave pride of place to some of his recent acquisitions, including, along the top of the wall, works by Alexandre Cabanel. Each of these three figures, Chiaruccia, the Thinker and Albaide, are meant to embody different aspects of human experience, active, contemplative and sensual. Moving down a row are small relief sculptures by two other artists from the Academy in Rome, a portrait of Brias by Eugène Guillaume and a plaster medallion of a young woman by Pierre Cavalier. Next comes a small nude by Longuet coming out of the bath and below this 
Another work by Cabanel, The Evening Angel, a drawing the artist had given Brias in thanks for his support. To the right, tucked behind the easel, is a further portrait of, Gle of Brias by Glaze, and oddly enough, we can't identify the landscape set up on the easel, though it is the single most prominent object in the room. According to Brias's own account of Glaze's painting, he and his friends had gathered to admire a landscape with setting sun, which had just arrived from Rome. To the right, further details allude to the international scope of Brias's interests, the objects scattered on the floor, exotic textiles, vases, a slipper, an animal skin, all allude to the Middle East. The view through the doorway or window above is evocative of Rome. And the sculpture of three female nudes on the pedestal probably refers to the Fountain of the Three Graces in Montpellier's main square, the Place de la Comédie. Notice also the small child peering around the base of the column, almost hidden in the shadows. He has never been identified, but I would suggest that he also refers to the Montpellier Fountain, one of the little putti which decorate its base. The left of the painting is dominated by the collector and members of his circle. Brias often described himself as being isolated and misunderstood within the context of provincial Montpellier, where many people believed his obsession with art to be ridiculous, even a kind of madness. So individuals on whom he could rely for practical and moral support had a special importance. The men here can all be identified. Furthest to the left is a lawyer friend, Auguste Bimard, then Brias himself, elegant as ever, in a satin robe de chambre and striped trousers. Standing just behind him is Henri Bricon, who would later assist Brias with his acquisitions in Paris. The older gentleman is Brias's father, who, willingly or otherwise, provided the money. In front of him, Leaning over a chair and gazing intently at the painting on the easel is Brias's lifelong friend, Louis Tissier, son of one of the partners of his father's bank. Brias rests a hand on Tissier's shoulder, perhaps in tribute to the fact Tissier had supported Brias from the very start. We might even speculate that Brias has presented the landscape here as a gift to his closest friend which would explain why it was never listed in Brias's own collection. The theme of Glaze's painting sits within a well-established tradition in Western art. Images of wealthy patrons showing off their collections to a select inner circle. We can link it with Vanini's fresco of Lorenzo de' Medici with his artists. Or we might think of Dutch and Flemish examples from the 17th century onwards. Again, such comparisons remind us of Brias's tendency to model himself on collections from the past and his ambition to be a new Medici of Montpellier. And what of the young woman, sitting on a chair with her back to us and looking towards Brias? She has always been something of a mystery, such a prominent yet anonymous presence. Perhaps she is meant to be a muse to Brias, a modern equivalent of the figure in Glaze's 1849 portrait. One possibility, which makes a good deal of sense, though impossible to prove, is that she is actually Brias's lover of the time, a woman identified by contemporaries only as Léa the Parisienne. Léa featured in several pictures in Brias's collection, including two portraits he commissioned from Marcel Verdier, of which one is illustrated here. Her importance to Brias also emerges in a later lithograph of 1856 by his friend Jules Laurent, The Dream in Life. This bizarre image, a kind of allegorical portrait, illustrates Brias's tendency to interweave collecting with his personal life. Above, we see Brias not once but three times, each portrait referring to a key stage in his artistic career, Montpellier in 1840, Rome in 1846 and Paris in 1853. Below we get a confusing scene of sin and redemption derived from a composition by another of Brias's favourite artists, Octave Tasset, but the central and most prominent figure is Leia, 
her pose modelled on that of Verdier's portrait, her presence somehow an embodiment of the collector's hopes, fears, desires and aspirations. Over time, Brias's views on art grew increasingly progressive. By the late 1840s, he had even started to dream that his collection might help to improve French society. He was drawing here on ideas widely held during the first half of the 19th century. First, a progressive view of history which envisaged human beings advancing step by step towards an age of democracy, peace and freedom. And second, a conviction that art might help to achieve this end. The ideas of the philosopher Charles Fourier were especially popular in the years following his death in 1837. Fourier had argued for a kind of utopian socialism in which all people enjoyed lives of harmony and abundance, a kind of early earthly paradise for the modern age. His followers spoke of finding a solution or cure for the inequality and conflict of society, and many of them looked to artists to help them make this solution a reality. The Fourierist writer, Lavadon, for example, championed art's transformative potential both in exposing the evils of the status quo and in offering a vision for a better world. Artists, he wrote, the time has come to take the sceptre and crown, to organise your reign in a new world where everything is luxury, splendour, beauty, love, happiness, exquisite harmonies. Some of Brias's closest friends were Fourierists, and Brias himself was strongly influenced by their ideas, but he was no revolutionary. In his dream of a solution, his art collection inaugurated a world of goodness and purity, truth and harmony, and he even envisaged the government of Napoleon III working to achieve lasting peace for French society. Brias tried to articulate these hopes, in the introductions to a series of catalogues of his collection, which he published during the early 1850s. The following extract is fairly typical. Art must try to find its humble solution everywhere. We shall call solution a painting that unites everything through its wonderful poems and portrays simple true nature with exquisite feeling. Artists form the solution. By 1853, when Brias wrote these words, he had been living in Paris for four years. This experience had transformed his understanding of modern art. He was encountering a range of possibilities inconceivable in the, a provincial town like Montpellier, and he was moving away from his early academic tastes towards more radical painters like Delacroix, Millet, Couture and Rousseau. But his hopes were mainly focused on a painter called Octave Tasset, whose painting, An Unfortunate Family, had been a surprise hit at the Salon of 1850. Enthused by this touching image of an impoverished family, Brias commissioned a replica for himself and began to imagine that he might have found the one, the artist who might help him achieve his vision. Tassett was thrilled to accept the challenge. In a letter of 1852, he wrote, You are taking great strides towards your solution. It is a noble effort from which you should emerge victorious. In line with his usual practice, Brias asked, asked Tassett to document in paint this latest phase in his collection. The studio of the painter includes several of the artist's recent works, most of them destined for Brias's collection. As with Glaze's interior of Brias's study, the figures examine a painting set up on an easel. It's the angel and child of about 1850. Above the sofa behind this, we see a portrait of the artist and then the unfortunate family. Together, these works encompass some of Brias's abiding concerns, the role of the artist, the ills of society, and the soul's salvation. To the right, leaning against the wall, is a large allegorical canvas titled Heaven and Hell, a lurid variation on the theme of The Last Judgment and the composition later featured in Laurent's Dream in Life. It must have been devised with significant input from Brias. His mistress Leia again features prominently. 
She is the dark-haired woman looking out towards us, her figure marking the dividing of the ways between salvation and damnation. She appears yet again in the upper left among a group of the saved, supported by a young man with red hair and beard who looks remarkably like Alfred Brias. And when we turn back to Tasset's Studio of the Painter, note that it's the collector and not the painter who takes centre stage. The third figure, relegated to the back of the room and looking rather bored, is Brias's servant, Joseph Fontaine. Beyond all the talk of social progress, there is something old-fashioned about Brias's conception of himself as a gentleman collector. He gestures towards one of Tasset's canvases, much as Lorenzo de' Medici pointed to Michelangelo's sculpture in the Pitti Palace fresco. In other words, Brias directs the creation of art, while the painter, Tasset, adopts a subservient role head lower than the collectors, turning towards Brias to accept his guidance. His pose recalls the female figure in Glazer's depiction of the interior of Brias's study, as if his function is in part to inspire the patron. Brias was still on the lookout for artist collaborators. Perhaps in the end Tasset was just too compliant, while Brias himself was becoming more daring, more willing to take risks with art that confronted traditional tastes. The next painter to catch his attention was the most radical of all, Gustave Courbet. Still only in his early thirties, but already a rising star of the contemporary French school, he would also prove to be the artist in whom Brias met his match. To understand why, it helps to consider some of the parallels and differences between these two men in their interests and personalities. Courbet was, in his own way, every bit as vain and self-centred as Brias, and he was just as obsessed with his own image. Like Brias, who commissioned portraits from all his artists, Courbet made his own identity central to his work. Through the first decade of his career in the 1840s, he had produced a series of self-portraits in each of which he explored a different face of himself as artist, proud, self-assured, terrified, mad, suffering, melancholic, romantic. As Corbet would later explain to Brias, they were a kind of autobiography in paint. Again like Brias, Corbet believed in art's transformative potential. He wanted his paintings to have an impact through their focus on ordinary people and their critique of the existing social order. But Corbet's politics were much more earthbound and radical than Brias's. He had welcomed the revolution of 1848 and the short-lived republic that followed it, and he was consistently hostile to the government of Napoleon III. But by far the most important difference between Corbet and Brias had to do with art, their views on the respective functions of painter and collector were diametrically opposed, where Brias, as we've seen, attributed an active creative role to the collector. Corbet set himself above anyone or anything that might constrain his vision. He must have absolute independence or he was nothing. In 1853, when Brias and Corbet met, the artist was already well on his way to achieving his ambition. He had won notoriety for a series of paintings showing the lives of ordinary people from his native Ornon. At the Salon of 1850-51, he presented three enormous canvases, the peasants from the fair, the stonebreakers and burial at Ornon, which established him as the leader of a new realism. Many contemporaries were appalled by the sheer ugliness of Corbet's work. They couldn't understand his insistence on showing the realities, warts and all, of rural society, or the portrayal of these facts on an epic scale, as if rural peasants were as important as the heroes of history and myth. But his talent was undeniable, and Corbet, whether you loved or hated him, was acknowledged to be a force to be reckoned with. As one critic of the time noted, Corbet has made a place for himself in the current French school 
in the way that a cannonball lodges itself in a wall. The artist's next move was to take on an icon of Western art, the nude. Shown at the Salon of 1853, Corbet's bathers attacked all established ideas about the nude in art. That it refer to some familiar biblical or classical narrative, that its forms be beautiful and refined, as was the case, for example, in Glaze's Blood of Venus. Corbet replaced goddesses with two contemporary women, one apparently getting undressed for her bath, the other stepping from a rather muddy pool of water. Instead of a legible anecdote involving goddesses and nymphs, Corbet made the interaction between the two figures utterly pointless and absurd, as if to mock the kind of conventionalised posturing seen in paintings, again like the Blood of Venus. And instead of graceful, refined forms, Corbet exaggerated his nude's heavy physicality, her folds of flesh, lumpy buttocks, massive haunches, and last but not least, dirty feet. No surprise then that the painting provoked a storm of controversy. Even Delacroix, generally a fan of Corbet, found his latest effort utterly bewildering. What do these two figures mean? A fat bourgeois seen from behind is stepping out of a little pool that looks too shallow even for a foot bath. She makes a meaningless gesture towards another woman, presumably her maid. As for the thought linking these two women, it is incomprehensible. Corbet would not have been surprised at such comments. He had set out to be provocative. But what must have surprised him was to encounter someone who seemed to actually appreciate his work and was even willing to pay for it. But that's what happened. Rias, who saw the bathers at the 1853 Salon, read the reviews and heard the jokes, saw in Corbet just the kind of artist he was looking for, a man so uncompromising, so unflinching in his convictions, so relentless in his pursuit of truth, might be a man who could help Rias raise his collection to national prominence. Brias bought two of Corbet's paintings from the 1853 Salon, including the bathers, and as ever, he seals this new alliance by commissioning a portrait. The resulting work is very much a product of the intense exchange of ideas between patron and artist during the early phase in their relationship. Brias appears more thoughtful, less poised and self-assured than in previous portraits, his left hand rests on a large volume inscribed Studies in Modern Art, Solution, A Brias, a title that alludes to the collector's cherished hopes for art and society. For the time being, at least, the interests and ideals of artist and patron worked in tandem. Corbet was delighted and flattered to have encountered a generous collector who seemed to genuinely appreciate his work and he even hoped that Brias' support might help him achieve, finally, the freedom he had dreamt of. After Brias returned to Montpellier in the autumn of 1853, Corbet wrote promising his allegiance. I am delighted that you are relying on me. I won't fail you, be sure. You have in your hands the means that I have always lacked and will always lack, with your background, your intelligence, your courage and your financial means, you can save us in our lifetime and allow us to enter a new era. Yet difficulty soon emerged over the respective roles of artist and patron. Brias, as we've seen, envisaged for himself an active creative role, while Corbet insisted on his independence. In a letter to Brias of May 1854, he made this plain. I hope to live by my art all my life without ever having departed an inch from my principles, without having betrayed my conscience for a single moment, without ever having made a painting as big as my hand to please anyone or to be sold. In fact, Brias did make an impact on Corbet. His financial support encouraged the painter's ambitions for what he might achieve, as did his vision of art's transformative potential. 
and paintings from Brias's collection would shape the direction of Courbet's work at one of the most important points in his career. In the spring of 1854, Brias was eager for Courbet to visit him. He felt isolated and misunderstood in Montpellier society. In many people's eyes, he wrote, I'm crazy. He longed for the company of someone who could understand what he was trying to do. We'll complete everything together. In a letter urging Courbet to come as soon as possible, Brias enclosed a photograph of the painter's studio by Tassert. This he annotated on the back. Dear Courbet, reflect on the subject that I'm sending you. It's the true poem of modern art. No doubt he hoped that Courbet would produce something of an equivalent type to mark their new alliance between art and patronage. Courbet was in Montpellier for several months in 1854. The main product of his stay, the meeting, did take up the theme of Tasset's painting, but just not in the way that Brias might have anticipated. It is, first of all, a much bigger picture, at three times the size of Tasset's painting, and Courbet removes us from the studio interior to the countryside outside Montpellier. The message here is that the landscape is his workspace, as befits a painter dedicated to nature and truth. Finally, Courbet inverts the relationship between artist and collector. Though Courbet, like Tassert, appears from the back, looking towards his patron, he isn't looking to Brias for any kind of guidance. On the contrary, it is Brias who takes the more passive role as he stands waiting to greet the artist alongside his deferential servant. Courbet seems taller than Brias, more active and self-assured, tilting his head back proudly as he approaches. In a battle of the beards, Courbet's would win. I wonder also if Courbet has in mind another work from the Brias collection, Glaze's portrait of 1849. In that work, remember, Brias was an impressive, glamorous figure draped in his oriental shawl accompanied by a beautiful young muse looking down at us from beneath the broad brim of his hat. The setting was a landscape outside Rome, alongside remnants of the classical past. Corbet has swapped the world of exotic dress, muses and classicism for the day-to-day -day reality of a road junction near Montpellier. And look at the shadows. Glazer's work has strong contrast between light and dark, with dark shadows falling over Brias's eyes and the figure of his muse. In Courbet's meeting, the only figure to cast a shadow is the artist. Brias and his servant are without shadows. They appear to be standing in the shade of a nearby tree. The effect is to make their figures appear less substantial than that of the painter, whose shadow takes on a dynamic, almost independent presence. The full implications of Courbet's painting emerged a year later when it was displayed to public and critics at the Exposition Universelle of 1855. This massive exhibition, planned by Napoleon III's government as France's answer to Britain's international exhibition of 1851, was by far the most important cultural event of the decade including a grand retrospective of the work of living French painters within a purpose-built palace of the fine arts. Courbet set his sights on this exhibition as a chance to present the full range of his achievements to date. Above all, he meant to showcase his monumental paintings of modern life, together with his latest realist masterpiece, The Studio of the Artist. But things didn't go to plan. In early April 1855, Corbet wrote to Brias, Terrible things are happening to me. They have just refused my burial at Ornon and my latest work, the studio. They, the exhibition jury, had told the artist that he would only be able to show 11 paintings. For Corbet, this was a disaster. But it shouldn't have been a surprise. Space in the exhibition building was limited and the submission of many painters had been rejected outright. It's reckoned that of about 8,000 paintings submitted, just over 1,800 had been accepted by the jury. 
In other words, over three quarters of the total number of submissions were rejected. A well-known lithograph by Daumier captures the despondency of those who have lost out on the chance to present their work to an international audience. The numbers for those who had work accepted was also striking. In the end, 799 painters showed a total of 1,831 works. That's an average of just over two paintings per painter. A small number of the most celebrated artists were invited to put on their own one-man exhibitions, notably Ingres and Delacroix, leaders respectively of the classical and romantic tendencies in French art. Ingres had a whole gallery to himself and used it to present a major survey of his life's work. The photograph here shows his apotheosis of Napoleon I, a ceiling painting completed just two years before for Paris's town hall. It was also one centrepiece in a display of 40 major pictures in the fields of portraiture, history painting and the nude. We can also see the Val Saint Beva of 1808, the portrait of Monsieur Bertin of 1832 and Joan of Arc at the coronation of Charles VII of 1854. Another highlight not illustrated in this photograph was the apotheosis of Homer in which the Greek poet is enthroned above representatives of Europe's classical tradition in art and literature. This enormous composition, completed in 1827, had affirmed Ingres' leadership of French classicism and Ingres was reminding the world of that fact in 1855. We need to bear in mind that Courbet was still a young painter in his 30s with nothing approaching the status of established masters like Ingres and Delacroix. Most artists in his position would have been pleased and grateful to have 11 of their pictures accepted. But then Courbet had no interest in being most artists. For some months he had been considering the possibility of a one-man show. He had even tried to persuade Bouillas to provide financial support. For whatever reason, Bouillas decided against. His father was vehemently opposed to the idea and perhaps Bouillas himself was growing uneasy about Courbet. The artist decided to go ahead anyway, covering all expenses himself. His Pavilion of Realism opened at the end of June 1855, over a month after the official exhibition. Now, in addition to his officially sanctioned display of 11 works in the main building, he had his own independent show of 39 paintings. In effect, Courbet was matching Ingres' classicism and Delacroix's romanticism with his own art of the future, realism. To accompany the show, Courbet compiled a catalogue with the help of his friend, the writer Jules Champfleury. Titled On Realism, the text was a manifesto of Courbet's beliefs above all the centrality of the artist's own independent vision. He wrote, I have simply wished to draw from the accumulated wisdom of tradition, a reasoned and independent sentiment of my own individuality. To be able to translate the habits, the ideas, the aspects of my epoch, according to my understanding, to be not only a painter, but a man. In a word, to make living art, that is my goal. He gave painted expression to these ideas in his studio of the artist. This was to be the centrepiece to his exhibition, the work that summed up his realist vision, as indicated in its full title, The Painter's Studio, A Real Allegory, Summing Up Seven Years of My Artistic and Moral Life. Courbet was marking out a key phase in his development, starting in 1848, when he began work on his big realist canvases and culminating in 1855, the year of his masterpiece. Courbet had started painting the work by December 1854, when he informed Wias, it will be the most surprising picture imaginable, the moral and physical history of my atelier, including the people who serve me and who participate in my action. The theme, an artist's studio, was hardly novel, but no one came close to matching Courbet in scale and ambition. The painting is huge, bewildering 
and strangely contradictory. After all, how can a picture be both realistic and allegorical? In effect, Corbet turns an actual place, his studio, into a site of history and myth. It's a modern equivalent to Angra's Homer, an apotheosis of Corbet, the painter, at work in the midst of those who support the new art. In Letters to Friends, the artist offered some limited explanations for the various figures in his picture. A letter to his friend Chantlery in late 1854 gave the most detail. Those to the left were subjects of his art, the people, misery, poverty, wealth, the exploited and the exploiters, those who live off death. They included representatives of the French state, past and present, those who fought for revolution, those who profited at the expense of others, and those, like the Irish woman we see huddled in the shadows with her child, who suffered injustice and poverty. The seated figure, Corbet identified simply as a hunter, and this is generally thought to be a disguised portrait of the current emperor, Napoleon III. Wary of state censorship, perhaps Corbet avoided being too specific. On the right were some of Corbet's artistic and bohemian friends, the people he called his shareholders, those who supported his ideas and participated in his actions. Among them were the poet Baudelaire, reading at the far right, and the writer Jules Champlery sitting in profile. Behind Champlery, standing amongst a group of collectors and friends at the back of the room, we can just make out the figure of Bouillas. The backdrop to this picture appears vague and mysterious. In a letter to Brias, Corbet said he would show a few of his most recent works, the Bathers and Peasants of Flagy. This last work does indeed make a hazy appearance to the upper left, where it seems to have been painted onto the studio wall like a fresco. Other vertical segments of landscape appear to the left and right, almost suggesting a view through a colonnade. The aim is perhaps to obscure the boundaries between the actual space of atelier and the natural world outside. Corbet's primary source of inspiration and the subject of the painting on his easel. The artist himself sits at the heart of the composition where he is accompanied by two figures, a child and a female model. The little boy may be a reference to Corbet's own childhood, since he wears the peasant dress of the artist's native region of Franche-Comté. Or he may embody an unformed talent, learning from the master. The nude stands just outside the bounds of the picture on the easel. As ever, Corbet emphasises her materiality. He signals her real existence as a model, implying that she has just taken off the dress that lies beside her on the floor. Corbet used a photograph from Brias's collection in the preparation of this figure. One of a series of female nudes by the photographer Julien Vallou de Villeneuve. But Corbet is working on a landscape, not a figure. So what is this figure doing here? And why is she the largest and most brightly illuminated figure in the room? The complex meanings embedded within Corbet's painting may never be fully understood. However, one possible reading is to see the work as the culmination of Corbet's association with Alfred Brias. We've already compared the meeting of 1854 with pictures Corbet saw during his time in Montpellier. In a similar way, but on a much grander scale, the studio of the artist is indebted to Brias and the works in his collection, while also pointing to the differences between artist and patron. Some of these connections are well known, notably the similarity between the theme of Corbet's work and Tassert's Studio of the Painter. And the historian James Rubin has indicated a link with one of the catalogues in Brias's collection. Rubin suggests that the full title of Corbet's work, The Painter's Studio, A Real Allegory, Summing Up Seven Years of My Artistic and Moral Life, may allude to the similarly grandiose title used by Brias for his 1854 catalogue, 
Explanation of the Paintings in the Collection of Monsieur Alfred Brias, Phase in the Education of an Artist from the Great Family. And the allegorical aspect to Corbet's work may refer also to works in Brias's collection, like Tassert's Heaven and Hell. But the key source for Corbet's composition is the picture we looked at earlier by Glaze, the interior of Brias's study. Of course, Corbet's picture is vastly more ambitious in size. The comparison here gives an idea of their difference in scale. But beyond that, there are clear similarities. The gathering of figures against a patchwork of paintings, a landscape on an easel as centrepiece, a scattering of objects across a floor, the opening into another space to the right, a round sculpted plaque on the wall, the theatrical use of draperies, sculpted figures, an old-fashioned artist's mannequin in Corbet, female nudes in Glaze, even the presence of a small child. And in both works, female figures have a central role. We noticed the young woman seated at the centre of Glaze's work, a kind of muse to the collector. Perhaps here again, Corbet is responding to Glaze, in which case this nude might have an equivalent function within the context of Corbet's realist allegory. A muse who inspires her artist's creativity, as well as being a real model who affirms his desire to reveal truth through art. Corbet's nude presents one further and even more intriguing connection with Brias. Her pose is remarkably close to that of the young woman in Verdier's portrait of the mistress of Brias. I've already linked her with the seated figure in Glaze's painting, but the visual similarities with Corbet's figure are even more striking. Look at the tilt of the head, the position of the hand, and the way she holds that piece of white drapery to her breast. Earlier, I suggested the importance of this young woman for Brias both as a man and collector. Has Corbet, in effect, appropriated Brias's muse for himself? In some respects, Corbet's studio of the artist reveals how much he owed to the collector. Brias's support had been a boost to Corbet's confidence and financial security at a key point in his career. His conversations with Brias about the potential role of art had helped to crystallise his own sense of what he as a painter might achieve. The promise of further funding had opened up the possibility of freedom from the public critics and state establishment, and works in Brias's collection provided the starting point for Corbet's greatest masterpiece to date. In the end, however, the goals of artist and patron were irreconcilable. Brias sought an active creative role in his collaboration with artists, while Corbet would not compromise his independence for anyone, even a patron as generous and enthusiastic as Brias. And this is the full message of the studio of the artist in which Corbet takes for himself the creative centrality that Brias so desired. Corbet knew exactly what he was doing. Writing to Brias in March 1855, he gave a completely misleading account of the patron's place in the picture. You are in a magnificent position, he wrote. You're triumphant and commanding. In fact, Brias' presence is insignificant and obscure. The message? That this man, to whom Corbet owes so much, and whom he has addressed so many times as the, his dear friend, is ultimately just grist to the creative mill. Corbet achieved some but not all of his goals in 1855. Financially, the Pavilion of Realism was a flop, even though beforehand Corbet had boasted to Rias of earning 100,000 francs. Contemporary critics were largely indifferent. They concentrated instead on the works Corbet had shown in the official exhibition. The studio of the artist never sold and remained rolled up in Corbet's studio. But over the longer term, 1855 was a breakthrough. 
Corbet's reputation for pride and self-aggrandizement were affirmed. No bad thing for a man like him. And over the longer term, his declaration of independence formed an important precedent. Increasing numbers of artists during the later 19th century would take similar initiatives, circumventing established institutions, salons, academies and government officials to gain greater control over the presentation of their work. For Brias, the encounter with Corbet ended in humiliation. He didn't visit Paris in 1855, so never saw Corbet's works at the Exposition Universelle, his one-man show, or indeed Studio of the Artist. But he did learn about the impact of Corbet's efforts through contacts in Paris and contemporary reviews. On top of the suspicion and resistance he had previously faced from family and neighbours in Montpellier, he now found himself at the receiving end of ridicule from Paris. The meeting, presented at the official exhibition, was the main target for criticism and jokes. The critic Edmond Abou called it fortune saluting genius and noted the fact that only Corbet's figure cast a shadow. He alone can block the rays of the sun. Caricaturists had a field day. Kiermois, like Abou, noted the missing shadows in a cartoon he entitled The Adoration of Monsieur Courbet, realist imitation of the adoration of the Magi. Everyone saw that this supposed meeting between painter and patron was actually a celebration of the artist as hero. The picture quickly acquired the title by which it is still generally known, Bonjour, Monsieur Corbet. Amazingly, Corbet wrote to Brias to ask if he might come to Paris and see his show. Brias declined. Pointedly alluding to his painting's new title, he made his feelings perfectly clear. Bonjour, Monsieur Corbet. Glory to you, dear friend, who for the sake of liberty has sacrificed us for the good. The relationship between Corbet and Brias was never the same again. But the final break came a few years later, in 1857, after Corbet made a second trip to the south of France with some of his students and his friend Jules Chanfleury. Brias offered his hospitality in Montpellier and even gave Chanfleury a tour of his gallery. Shortly thereafter, the writer published a story he called The Sensations of Josquin, the story of Monsieur Tay, and this was a thinly veiled satire on Bouillas and his collection. The main character, Monsieur Tay, is diagnosed early on in the story as a man suffering from a peculiar mania, which consists in collecting nothing but portraits of himself, on which he has spent hundreds of thousands of francs. Chanfleury even mocks Bouillas's social idealism how many of these bourgeois utopians have I encountered who to their misfortune have learnt to read? The damage to the corbet brias friendship was this time irreparable. Corbet made a weak effort to dissociate himself from Chanfleury's work and in future years he would make a further few overtures to Brias, perhaps hoping for renewed support, but nothing came of them and the two men never met again. In some ways, the relationship between Corbet and Bouillas followed the course of a doomed love affair. Delighted infatuation, followed by intimacy, mutual understanding and plans for the future, then growing doubts, sliding into betrayal and disillusionment. Behind it all was a conflict between two mismatched conceptions of art and the respective roles of buyers and makers. Bouillas, as we have seen, was both idealistic and nostalgic in seeking to create a collaborative pact between himself and his artists, imagining himself as a new kind of Medici for the 19th century. In response, Corbet asserted his own creative ascendancy, citing works in Bouillas's collection to present an alternative narrative in which the artist was the uncontested hero. In the short term, the Corbet episode left Brias profoundly hurt, his self-confidence damaged. He pulled back from some of his grander, more radical ideas. But over the longer term, 
his legacy would be substantial. He continued to buy art, concentrating on filling out the gaps in his collection with works by Jericho, Delacroix, Ingres and others. He even bought one of Courbet's landscapes. All of these he donated to the Musée Fabre in Montpellier. Thanks to Bouillas, the city gained a rich and remarkably diverse collection of 19th century French art, including some outstanding works by Gustave Courbet. Thank you very much for listening.